Now, I, I've read recently uh, there's been some uh, renewed discussion in Japan about the use of a, of a sarcophagus approach to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Fukushima. Now that, for those of you who have followed uh, <coughs> the uh, Chernobyl accident, you know that that's what they did there. They, they, they basically buried it in concrete and lead and <coughs> did not attempt to clean it up. And so there is a possibility that they may have to go that way in, in, in Japan at, at Fukushima. There, I get a report about every two weeks from, uh, from Japan, and you know, they're ex extremely technically detailed and complex, and I don't even try to read it all. But they talk about the migration of radioactive, radioactive material into the, into the ground strata, and how they're going to you know, how they're going to try to stabilize that uh, to keep it from eventually going into the ocean. They have built a bunch of walls in the ocean in the on the waterfront there to try and keep the stuff from uh, flowing out to the ocean, and they're probably going to have to do a lot more of that. The figures that Dale gave you about the cost of cleaning up Fukushima is the cost of cleaning up Fukushima right. the reactor. The much larger question is what do you do for the countryside that's been contaminated? And to put that in human terms just for one moment, um, the Japanese government uh, about a year ago attempted to relax the radiation protection standards a hundredfold uh, because schoolyards were so radioactive that uh, they would have to scrape off the topsoil or bar the kids from going out to the playground. Um, and so they chose instead to relax the standard to a figure of two rem per year, which by their own estimates for young children would cause a cancer in every hundredth kid. From just one year of going to school and playing in the playground. And I mean, I have some sympathy for the Japanese government. What do you do when a large part of your countryside is contaminated at levels that are normally considered unacceptable. Um, but relaxing the standards seems to be a pretty poor approach. So what we're not yet talking about is what is the effect beyond the boundaries of the plant. Um, in some senses, the, the Japanese got lucky because the wind blew a fair amount of the radioactivity out to the ocean. On the other hand, we've never had an accident in which that much radioactivity was dumped into an ocean. It was not just by airborne and falling down, but what Dale and I were dealing with day by day during the accident was because the reactors were failing, they were trying to use these pressure suppression pools as a way of trying to cool things down and reduce the pressures, and quickly that stuff boiled away. They had to dump this radioactively contaminated water into the ocean. Uh, they would bring in salt water in to spray into the cores and having that stuff go in the ocean. There were levels of radioactive cesium and strontium and iodine in the sea off of Fukushima that were millions of times permissible concentrations. Millions of times. And what that does, no one can really think about, figure out. Yes, the ocean will dilute things, but sea life concentrates it. Yes. It works its way up the food chain. I have not seen any models that deal with what the long-term effect oh. are of that much radioactivity going into an ocean. So, you know the old line, um, it's a lot easier, uh, uh, it's, it's, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's very hard to get it back in. Yeah. Well, it, nothing is truer um, than radioactivity for that. And so, you, what you want to do is avoid getting it out. And it didn't happen. You should understand what the two of us were going through during those days. Um, we heard they lost power, we heard they lost backup. We didn't quite know why they lost the backup, now we know, it got flooded. And then, I mean, you understand, there's someone who's been technically critical of nuclear power for years, there's something inside your soul that doesn't want to believe what you say yourself. Right. It can't possibly be that bad. And I don't think either of us have ever contemplated a situation with three reactors, no. four spent fuel pools, could be at risk. Um, and then we watched while one reactor after another after another had hydrogen explosions. Mm. We'd always thought a hydrogen explosion was theoretically possible, something you kind of worried about, but we kind of worried about it on paper. And to see the actual footage of the explosion, and then to see another one, and another one. I mean, it wasn't 
this was one quirk for one reactor. This was a fundamental design defect. And that is, in large measure, what Dale had been arguing about from the beginning. These containments, to save money, were small. They couldn't contain the accident. And we saw at Fukushima, the stuff went right out. And Dale has been very kind to California to say we have no BWRs, uh, uh, boiling water reactors, no Mark I containments. But he was also reminding me that boiling water reactors don't have steam generators. <laughs> Because we have pressurized water reactors, we have steam generators, and that's what's failing at San Onofre. Well, in fact, Dan, at GE, the party line was, we don't have to worry about steam generator failures because hmm. ours already failed 100%. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we pre-failed our steam generators by not having them. Some uh, uh, acoustic devices to listen for vibration, and the problem was they weren't listening <laughs> the last year or two. During the period that the steam generators were tearing themselves apart, the acoustic sensors were detecting that, but the operators simply ignored it. This um, time they might not ignore it quite as readily. But um, that's not, look, what concerns me is not as one to break in with a small amount coming out. What concerns me, the, the kind, there's certain kinds of accidents that you worry about with steam generators. Dale knows this vastly better than I, but you worry about a main steam line break. If the main steam line breaks, you're de reduce the pressure um, on the outside of these tubes, which essentially puts them under tremendous stress. And that stress, under certain circumstances, could cause them to burst. So if I have a main steam line break, I can propagate a whole bunch of uh, tubes breaking. And the reason this is particularly ner nerve-wracking for San Onofre is that they had eight tubes in Unit 3 that when they pressure tested, tested to the kind of pressure they might get if there was a main steam line break, they it burst. Did. And they burst when they were 11 months old. Um, and under normal circumstances, they wouldn't have even gone in and checked to see how much wear there was for another year plus. So if the model's wrong, if they get a lot of wear between shutdowns and something happens, you can have an accident. Look, I think both of us would say there's a re pretty reasonable chance they could run for five months and nothing's going to happen. There's a reasonable chance they could start up and run for another ten months and nothing would happen. But there's a non-negligible chance that something could happen. Mm -hmm. And you're gambling with an awful lot of people. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, you did not mention, I don't think, in your presentation, is how many steam generator tubes there are in, in, this, in these plants. Each steam generator has about 10,000 tubes, and there are two steam Jeez. generators in each unit. So there are four, there's 40,000 tubes. A lot of places where something could go wrong. You also should know that the steam generators at San Onofre, to the best I've seen reported, I believe is correct, are the largest steam generators in the country, which is a part of the problem. They're trying to extract a massive amount of heat and um, they had to do some innovations with the design. Maybe my ring finger. And uh, yeah, I think Dora said there are four one hundred, four one hundred of an inch thick. Well, well that's what they're supposed to be. The, yeah. There are thousands of them now that aren't. <laughs> because what those yeah. figures I showed you are the wear. So they've lost 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent of the thickness. They're supposed mm -hmm. to get plugged at 35 percent but they're already like halfway there to once they haven't plugged. And that's pretty amazing, you know, your teeth, your adult teeth are supposed to last your life or close to your life. At a certain point, you begin to have a little bit of grinding down of them on those surfaces, yeah. okay? Well, that's okay when you're in your 60s, you know, you've eaten a lot of meals. It's not supposed to happen within a few months of you getting yeah. that first set, and that's, that's what's happened with these steam generators.